BBOR, Black Box, Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia, Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Friday. Another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? Now, recently on the channel, I've done several episodes about the Son of Sam, as well as discussing some theories that attempt to connect the Son of Sam to other true crime cases, particularly via Maury Terry and his book, The Ultimate Evil. And that will be the focus of today's episode, except this will be done in the Q&A session format, where I will be responding to your questions and comments from those recent episodes. And if you want to follow along with all of these true crime discussions, I invite you to hit the like button and subscribe. Every Monday I do an episode about the Zodiac Killer, and on Wednesdays I do one about Jack the Ripper. For the most recent Zodiac Monday, I was discussing the book The Son of Zodiac by Jack Myers, and some of that will be worked into this episode here. And if you are interested in obtaining bonus content from Black Box Online Radio, I invite you to go through some of the links in the description box, including the one for buymeacoffee.com. BuyMeACoffee.com slash BlackBoxNid88 allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. And firstly, we need to provide the introduction that a series of homicides were committed in the late 1970s that have been attributed to David Berkowitz, who is known as the 44 caliber killer as well as the Son of Sam shooter. And even to this day, there are people who do not accept that David Berkowitz was a lone gunman. They thought that he was part of a type of group murder theory operation. And on this channel, in terms of true crime terminology, I use the terms group murder theory and multiple killers theory, but they are not synonymous. Multiple killers is more of an umbrella term, and that could also mean a disconnected group, unrelated homicides that people think are simply the work of one serial killer when it turns out there's actually two and um, to just unconnected people. It's a very big theory in the Long Island serial killer mystery. And the group murder theory would mean that there is an organized group that committed the murders, that there was an organized group that planned and executed everything in some type of direct manner or fashion. And a lot of people are on the comments section discussing that to this day. They simply do not think that David Berkowitz acted alone. And even some of the people who are directly affected by the Son of Sam shootings, went on to believe that David Berkowitz did not commit all of the murders. And I have to just share something that somebody brought to me offline, and they asked a question about Nisa Moskowitz, who was the mother of Stacy Moskowitz, one of David Berkowitz's victims. And he said that, now it's true that Nisa Moskowitz went on to believe that David Berkowitz did not kill her daughter, that he was not the gunman, he was not the trigger man for that specific incident. And I said, yes, I confirm that. I mean, Nisa Moskowitz was very public and very much in the spotlight, and you can hear her testimonials and her side of the story in numerous places on YouTube. And the question that was truly asked me was, how was he able to convince her of that? And I know that this is not going to be an exciting answer for some people, but he lied. I think that David Berkowitz just lied, and a lot of people believe that David Berkowitz was a liar. And earlier this year, I went through the multi-part series called The Son of Sam Saga on the Serial Killer podcast, which is hosted by Thomas Vyborg Thune. And 
he simply um, just pointed out that David Berkowitz is a very manipulative person to this day. He's a very sneaky and deceptive person to this day, and he is also somebody who um, does not like to tell the truth, and I have to agree. Now, we're going to see that he's not the only liar in the story, but um, I would like to get to some other comments that came from people. Now, the Son of Sam fam, the Son of Sam story is very much connected to some of the families that live in the vicinity of David Berkowitz and lived in the same neighborhood, and one of them was the Carr family. And for the most recent Anything Goes Friday segment, I did an episode called Son of Sam, the Death of John Carr. John Carr was someone who was actually the son of a man named Sam. His father was Sam Carr, and David Berkowitz um, has been somewhat falsely linked to this family, and they're just thinking that the Carr brothers were involved with these shootings, and they are the other possible participants in these homicides. And I was contacted via the comment section here by Wheat Carr, who is the sister of John Carr, and I definitely um, appreciate anything that she would have to say, and I mean, I'll just read her comment right here. An interesting presentation. There are a few errors or facts that be can be corrected. John Carr died near a place near named Minot, and you pronounced it Mino, and I am so sorry for that. Some people have pointed out that I mispronounced the place in North Dakota as spelled M-I-N-O-T, and I was pronouncing it Minot, and I fully admit that I'm not a Son of Sam expert, but interestingly, after Wheat Carr wrote this into the comments section, I mean, we're talking like 30 minutes later, I just happened to be on Instagram, and the first thing that came up was something from the Minot, Minot State football team, and I was like, I just couldn't believe that, you know, it's just, just a weird coincidence, but... One other um, point that Wheat Carr makes in her comment is, one would be very su uh, one would be the very subtle difference between new of and new. Another thing you might want to look at is how and if Maurice knew my brother. You stated that they were in the same homeroom. That's by Maurice's own writings on page two fifty nine and two sixty. Another misleading comment on those pages implies that Maurice and his cousin Mary Ellen were also in the same homeroom at the time. SHS and all grade levels admitted boys and girls in high school, and they did not share the same homeroom. So Maurice's reference to John, Maurice and Mary Ellen in the same homeroom is another a misleading statement. My father was very strict, and therefore was not always an easy man to live with, but he was not abusive, and frankly there are many who could relate more good than bad, but have always hesitated to do so after seeing how those dared to speak up were attacked and denigrated. And no, uh, thank you to Manny Grossman for finding the original myth representation in PDF version of the ultimate evil. So with somebody like Wheat Carr, I would just turn the floor over to her. And I openly said, um, hi, Wheat, thank you for visiting my channel. I didn't expect to get a message from the real Wheat Carr. If you ever like to, would let, like to set the record straight with additional comments for the followers of Black Box Online Radio, you're welcome to post here. I'm sure you know better than anyone that there are certain conspiracy theories that continue to spread online. If you have a longer message, you can contact me. And I would just give her the floor. I would just allow her to just give her side of the story because she is someone who was personally affected by the stories surrounding David Berkowitz, and even even in relation to the death of her brother, John Carr. Now, the episode that I did on John Carr was done for a very specific reason, because when I did a Son of Sam episode earlier this year, I mean, I was just faced with the type of theory that was John Carr murdered in North Dakota because he was connected to some type of nationwide cult, or did he commit suicide, and it's just another tragedy that is connected to the story. And you will find that a lot of promoters of these types of conspiracy theories have um, a rather sad commonality, and that is that they don't want to just admit that terrible things happen. They don't want to admit that it's just a lone gunman who wasn't able to get the sex that he wanted, so he wanted revenge on society because he felt like he was inferior, and he wanted to prove to himself and also to the world in some type of secretive way that he was indeed superior to them after all. It's about egoism, it's about sexuality, about hormones, and of course, of course, about some type of genetic component as well as child abuse. Manny Grossman, who runs a channel that talks a lot about the Son of Sam as well as the ultimate evil and the interconnections among these cases, 
responded to Weekar by saying, You are very welcome, Weed. I am proud to be the person who has finally been able to clear your family name from the stain that Mori Terry put on it. You have been treated horrifically by the followers of Mori Terry, and it is sick it is a sickening chapter of true crime history that is now thankfully over. Well, in the on the one hand, Manny Grossman is making a point, but on the other hand, the idea that Maury Terry um, had shared in the ultimate evil is definitely discussed by quite a few people, and it's definitely shared by individuals just in even in the comments section on Black Box All Night Radio when they're talking about how Number one, they believe that there were multiple killers in the Son of Sam case. Some of the evidence is, I mean, the strongest piece of evidence to support their claims is that there are multiple composite sketches of the shooter that don't all resemble David Berkowitz. They think they resemble other people. David Berkowitz also admitted to Maury Terry that he was only responsible for two of the murders, but he was a lookout and he was a participant in all of them. And someone else also asked me this question offline by saying that, how would that be possible? How would it be possible for Berkowitz to be interrogated by the police and know all of the details about the crimes at a level where they became convinced that he was responsible for it? And, like, if he were just a lookout, wouldn't he be able to miss... Wouldn't he make mistakes, misspeak, or get the story incorrectly? And... I don't know if that's the most legitimate question, and that's perhaps not an answer that people want to hear. I mean, that is perhaps not something that people want to even discuss or entertain. But that um, I mean, because that could go either way. If somebody is a lookout and they are a witness to the crime, then they would most likely know all the events of how things took place. And if there was a multiple killers operation where they're passing around the same forty-four caliber handgun, then... I mean, they're probably going to have conversations about it, and everybody's going to be on the same page. So I think that that, that that question could be interpreted in two ways, and the answer to that is not going to be satisfying to anyone. But did um, how, how connected was David Berkowitz to the families in, this, in his neighborhood? And I'm going to read a comment here, and I'm going to share my own take. It's from Jay Catalano, who says... Please don't take our word for it. Listen to Berkowitz's own voice on the Killer Tape podcast, which was recorded in March of 1980, episode number 14 at 12 minutes and 38 seconds. I never met the cars personally, episode 14, 15 minutes, 25 seconds. I looked in the phone book and I saw that there was a man named Craig Glassman, episode 14 at 29 minutes and 25 seconds. I started to blame Sam Carr for everything. I had to convince myself that he was to blame and his dog was giving me orders. Seems pretty obvious that Berkowitz didn't know any of the people in his neighborhood that he was harassing. Okay, so my immediate response is, that is something that I did not expect. I thought that I was going to go into the Son of Sam story and find out, oh yeah, well sure, I mean, David Berkowitz knew the Sons of Sam, and he, he knew the Carr brothers, and he knew perhaps Wheat Carr, and he knew Sam Carr, and he just, he knew these people, and he was very much in their social circle, and um, they he had interacted with all kinds of uh, people in the neighborhood. Craig Glassman would have been another one. But if all of this is true, that would mean that, no, Berkowitz was just some type of loner who was possibly a schizophrenic, but he was given the original diagnosis of psychopathy with malingering tendencies, meaning they thought that he was faking certain aspects of his mental state. I'm not completely convinced if David Berkowitz was a schizophrenic or not, but when I read the Son of Sam letters, I have to say this over and over again, they come across as absolutely more deranged and discon bobulated and disjointed than the Zodiac Killer's letters. You can definitely see some type of mental thought pattern that appears to be very, very muddled and very, very much um, presented in a twisted way. But that's my personal take on the subject. Now, here's another uncomfortable and almost, um, almost a fact that I even have trouble to this day accepting that I don't want to accept. And it goes well beyond, well, did David Berkowitz know the other people in the Son of Sam story? They get talked about this, like the Carr brothers, and as I said, they get accused of being the multiple uh, shooters or participants in this group that is connected to the nationwide cult. Well, a lot of these theories that get shared about the nationwide cult and the link between the Son of Sam and the Manson family comes to us from Maury Terry. And to the credit of Manny Grossman, he has gone through the ultimate evil, and he's done a very 
large deep dive and expose on Maury Terry. And from Manny Grossman's own words here on the, on the comments section on Black Box Online Radio, it comes across as stating that Maury Terry was a liar. He was the other liar that I was referring to, and showing documented examples of how Maury Terry intentionally fabricated the narrative in The Ultimate Evil, and even as I say that to you now, I don't want to accept that. I want to believe that Maury Terry was an honest participant and a good actor, and just simply mistaken. But I think that that is just another very saddening aspect of the true crime world, that there are people out there who are talking about true crime stories. Do you hear that word? True crime stories, and they're not even telling the truth themselves. They either get caught up in their own storytelling, or, I mean, see, already I'm trying to make excuses. It just, it's just some people would come out and just say things that are factually inaccurate for their own self-serving reason. And it goes so far beyond Maury Terry, because what about Robert Graysmith, the author of Zodiac and Zodiac Unmasked, as well as a host of other true crime books who are, that are just filled with falsehoods? And I think that I had a little bit more of, um, of ease. I had an easier time accepting that Robert Graysmith was a liar and a fraud. I repeat that, a liar and a fraud, because... I did not use Robert Graysmith as the source material for anything in my explorations into the Zodiac mystery for years. And this is something that I don't talk about a lot, but I've never actually read the 1986 book Zodiac. So it was always something that was an outside factor. I did read Zodiac on Maps, though, and I did a multi-part book discussion on it here on Black Box Online Radio. It's a useless book. I don't think there's anything of value in it. And maybe Manny Grossman would say something similar about the ultimate evil. But as far as um as far as accepting that, I mean I want to be very clear, so many primary source documents are available online that we can evaluate for ourselves. You can even get on Google Images and just pull up all types of copies that have been made of not only the um police reports, but how about things like the letters that were written by the killers, by the Zodiac and the Son of Sam, as well as um, another true crime cases, everything from Jack the Ripper to the Black Dahlia Avenger. But I also want to look at some of the um, other comments that came in on the episode that I did about the Son of Zodiac, because that, that is discussing a book by Jack Myers, and it's talking about how the Zodiac crimes and the Son of Sam crimes were indeed connected to a nationwide cult that was responsible for a lot of the um, atrocities and these high-profile homicides that we've become very familiar with. And I do have to give uh, credit to uh, Jack Myers. As somebody pointed out in the comments section that um, I was very critical of him by saying that he thought that the Zodiac Killer's Lake Berryessa stabbing was filmed. And I was like, well, there's no physical evidence that there was there were any footprints or anything from a second perpetrator. There's no there were no three holes found on the ground for a tripod that was used for a camcorder of anything. The Lake Berryessa stabbing occurred on September twenty seventh of nineteen sixty nine, which saw the death of Cecilia Shepherd, and somebody wrote out I don't have that comment in front of me, but they said that the theory is actually that it took place on a boat that the cameraman would have been on a boat and using some type of strong zoom lens. That's why there's no evidence of it. Well, I mean, if there's no evidence of it, I don't, I don't think that that is the, um, I don't think that that is the most plausible theory then. And Manny had his own response to Jack Myers in the book, The Son of Zodiac. Right now on my most recent Stacey Moskowitz walk and talk, Jack Myers felt the need to pipe up and tell us how wrong we are. All he did to counter was quote Maury Terry's book back to us. Classic circle-jerking move. And um, Manny Grossman refers to um, this type of exploration into true crime conspiracies as a circle-jerk, meaning that in the literal sense, in terms of... Oh, not the literal sense, sorry. In the, in the sense of, like, actually going in circles where people are trying to um, just cite the conspiracy theory. Well, what's your evidence for that? Well, it's in the conspiracy theorist's book. Well, where did he get it from? He got it from the truth. Well, how do you know it's true? Because it's in the book. They are literally going in circles. So, um, back to Manny's comment. 
The guy represents the last gasp of a dying paradigm in true crime history, the conspiracy era. The, con the era of conspiracies in true crime got its main start with the publication of The Ultimate Evil, a book that almost is literally made up from start to finish. But this book started putting people down a path of thinking that people with the same last name are definitely related and definitely involved with each other in criminal conspiracies. It started with people thinking about reading newspapers and books constituted in real forensic studies, and basically it dumbed down the entire subject to the point where people like Jack Myers and Horan can actually get a few people to believe them. Those days are over, though. And as far as true crime conspiracy theories go, I definitely am a supporter of some of them, but here's something that people also don't want to talk about, because this might sound boring, this might sound mundane, However, with true crime conspiracy theories, I use the definition of a conspiracy as two or more people hiding the truth, usually for a malicious reason. And you might encounter a conspiracy where the police made errors during their investigation, and then they lied to cover it up, just to save face, just because they didn't want to admit fault, to protect somebody's reputation. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, stuff like that is going to happen. How about evidence was handled improperly, and they lied about it? And to, again, to just not to admit fault in their types of wrongdoings. And that is well beyond, well beyond something such as, well, a true crime writer, or perhaps somebody such as Maury Terry, who is trying to present himself as a journalist. One thing that I do with Black Box Soul Mine Radio is I'm very clear that I am not a journalist. This is a commentary channel, making comments about material that has been shared to the general public. And sometimes it's things behind closed doors that I can't talk to you guys about yet, but hopefully in the near future. But true crimes conspiracies can also definitely exist in the sense that two or more people hiding the truth usually for a malicious reason how about the actions of serial killers? Serial killers do work in groups and pairs. And I was recently watching the movie The Hillside Strangler, which is actually about the Hillside Stranglers, plural. And in some ways, that would be a conspiracy theory because you have people who are committing murders and then they're returning to normalcy and trying to live normal lives. Yet, they actually had a serial killer partnership. I'm talking about Ken Bianchi and Angelo Bono, also known as Tony. And that is, in some ways, is a true crime conspiracy, but that's definitely not what people are thinking about. Now, somebody asked me this once. How on earth do these um, nationwide cult movements get connected? Because, as stated in Jack Meyer's book, that it talks about how the Lake Berryessa stabbing from the Zodiac Killer was filmed, and that the uh, it was a snuff film where someone was murdered and videotaped. Well, why why does this all take place? Why does this all... Why does this all happen to begin with? And here is my attempt to share the dark secrets of the true crime conspiracy theory world. And that is that, firstly, you have a group of people that would be committing homicides. And the reason why they commit homicides is because they have been either instructed or ordered to do so by a larger group. And, I mean... Think about them as the intermediary. It's like you have the low levels and then the intermediary. Then it gets connected to the nationwide movement. And this nationwide movement is a series of interlocking ideas that gets manipulated and directed and managed by an entity such as the CIA. Or it could be another similar one, but the CIA is often accused of this. What's the benefit of this? The reason is because the CIA is the private arm of the global elites. They are not a true government function, or even if they are, they are the fifth branch of government. There are not three branches of government. There are five, executive, legislative, judicial. The fourth is the electorate, like the people, the populace, the persons who actually have a say in things by using your right to vote. And the fifth is the CIA. The one is interweaving through all of these other ones and also doing things that are covert and clandestine and operating in somewhat of an unseen way. Two or more people hiding the truth, right? So that is a conspiracy. Now, the reason why the snuff films get involved so frequently is, think about somebody such as Jeffrey Epstein, for example. Okay, he was, you know, running Lolita Island, Little St. James, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and all types of billionaires and famous people, as well as um, um, public figures such as Prince Andrew, are involved with Epstein's Island. And these people don't have to be. They have access to drugs and sexual partners in other places, interlocking network of 
criminal behavior, and they use the criminal behavior as a form of blackmail. Let's say, for example, somebody gets elected to Congress, and then, once they're in Congress, they have to... They get invited to some type of event. They go to an event, and they get introduced to someone who looks very young, but they tell them that they're age-appropriate, they lie to them, and then they have sex with an underage prostitute. After that, then, that underage person is murdered on film. And then they say, okay, that person you were with who was underage just got murdered. You are going to do everything we say. We own you. Otherwise, you will be vilified for her murder or his murder, which is on film now, and we can destroy you at any moment. It creates a blackmail system which furthers the agenda of the global elites. And the elites work in a type of oligarchical fashion where it's not done by money. That's the plutocracy. It's not done by military dictatorship. It is done as an oligarchy. Oligarchy meaning the few. It's the concentration of wealth and concentration of power, but only certain people are in it. I mean, having money does not mean that you get to control the world. Does Oprah Winfrey control the world, first black female billionaire? Like, does she run the world? Does Michael Jordan control the world? I mean, he was much more influential on perhaps the economy of Malaysia than people give him credit for because of his shoes. But does he actually control the world? No. So the ultimate answer is that this type of theory is that there are these types of individuals who organize, manipulate, direct, and manage lots of different crimes that take place throughout the country and the world. And they use things such as snuff films, such as murders, for two specific reasons. One of them is blackmail, and the other is general sadism. Because I asked somebody who believed this theory once, like, what do you think that that's all about? Like, do you think anyone actually believes that um, the global elites are running a, an operation like this? And he said, yes, I do. I think these global elites are as close to pure evil as possible, meaning that the people who are actually orchestrating all of this <laughs> enjoy destroying humanity. And you can't do it by simply just getting a private army together and just shooting people. Then the power structure wouldn't exist anymore. The power structure has to be preserved by having these types of individuals operate in an unseen manner. For the Orwellian fascist police state to exist, the illusion of freedom must be maintained. Someone named Winston, I presume, wrote that out in the comment section on someone else's channel um, years ago, but that's always stayed with me. Now, is any of that true? Um, mostly no, because here's the problem. Some people insist that it has to be done in a very specific way. It has to be done with the blackmail and the orgies and the weird sex acts and the videotapes of weird sex acts. Why do they have to micro-analyze these specific behaviors that are most likely fictitious? Why do they have to micro-analyze the power structures of these criminal behaviors where you have the elites and the intermediaries and then the low-level criminal thugs which David Berkowitz's little serial killer cult would have been, why do those have to be put into place? Why can't we just simply admit that there are criminals out there who commit crimes for selfish reasons? There are criminals out there who commit crimes and then lie about it. Now, there's a book out there that is written by Carl De Niro, who is one of the surviving victims of David Berkowitz, and the subtitle of it is I Wasn't Shot by David Berkowitz. He is also somebody who has been pulled into this um, web of constructed statements from David Berkowitz, because I'm as someone who is somewhat of a newcomer into the Son of Sam world. I'm not even completely convinced of all of the um, details, or when I say not convinced, it's difficult to differentiate when David Berkowitz is telling the truth or not, and I just simply think that that relates back to his psychopathic tendencies. One aspect of psychopathy and sociopathy is that people want to manipulate because it's just like going through a set of actions. Okay, I'm going to say this. Now, if this person says that, then I can make this statement. And it's always about obtaining the upper hand in the situation. If he's constantly creating fictitious stories, then he has the ability to lie, and then he knows the truth, and other people do not. He is the one who has all the information, and they only have partial pieces of the true information, whereas he would know everything. So that's my ultimate take 
on David Berkowitz. I do think that he is a liar, and to the credit of Manny Grossman, he has shown several numerous examples about how Maury Terry has lied on his YouTube channel and how he was genuinely trying to deceive people, as opposed to being someone who just simply didn't get his facts right. Or, um, what I would, you know, originally have thought about Maury Terry and the Ultimate Evil was that all right, this guy had a theory, and he began exploring it, and he just went down the rabbit hole. He began cherry-picking to get a desired result. He began pattern-seeking, but that doesn't make someone a fraud or a liar. But, I mean, if somebody actually knows better, then, and they know facts to the contrary, and they want to state the facts anyway, there is something that is immoral, unethical, and devious about that. But what do you think about any of this? What do you think about Maury Terry and the Ultimate Evil and how the Son of Sam murders could be connected to a larger nationwide cult movement? What do you think about anything I said about the power structures of the elites and how they use these type of snuff films as ways to blackmail people who are who are being absorbed into the oligarchy? And let's be very clear, if, if that were to take place, which I am not saying it is, then the people who are blackmailed are the pawns on the chessboard, and the actual oligarchs would be um, all, the, all the people like the king, the queen, the rook, and the bishop, and the knight. And I think you're already thinking of some ways in which you can organize that. I could talk to you for about 45 straight minutes just on how we can metaphorically assign the different roles of um, the global elites to those chess pieces. But yes, there's a difference between being a pawn and being a rook. So that's all for me now. What do you think about anything that has been discussed in this episode? Thanks again to Wheat Car for visiting my channel, and feel free to look through some of the links in the description box. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnet88 over on Instagram. And I will see you over there. Until next time.